Hello, and a very, very warm welcome to Fireside Chats. I am Magla Pillay, and today we will be looking at the subject of reality is in the eye of the beholder. If this expression is new to you, fear not. It's new to most people because you're probably familiar with a similar sounding expression. In the series, we deal with a number of topics surrounding spirituality. We look at what spirituality means to you as an individual. We ask you important questions such as, are you happy with the quality of your life? Is there anything that you would like to change or improve? And we specifically ask you to focus on your relationship with God. Is he just an idea to you, a name or a concept? or? Do you enjoy a deep and meaningful interaction with the Supreme Soul? I'd like to introduce you to Sister Denise, who has been a Raj Yoga meditation practitioner for a number of decades. Sister Denise, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And welcome. Um, reality is in the eye of the beholder. Um, Shakespeare coined the original expression in which he said beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Why is it that you're of the view that all of reality is in the eye of the beholder? Well, it's because what we consider to be reality is perception. Okay. Could and you perception uh, is really very subjective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when you see something you say this is real you can touch it you can move it around it's solid um, and we are so caught up in materialism that we believe that if it's material it's real uh, but the way that you perceive material reality is through your organs of perception now, if you take um, the feeling of weight, uh, the scale will say it is this many kilograms, but depending on how strong you feel that day, it'll feel heavier or lighter, you see. So it depends on something internal. You look at something and you say, this is beautiful, Somebody else will look at the same thing and say it's awful. Um, it's um, a matter of taste. Um, you can also say, okay, this is important. Um, then it's a matter of values. What is more uh, having higher value for you? Something else or different criteria has higher value for someone else. So we are actually a lot more subjective than we um, admit a lot of the time. And um, a lot of people, they also feel that to be objective is good and to be subjective is bad. Now, anything that you perceive through an organ of perception, with or without the aid of any technology, is subjective because I the self perceive this thing through my body so that makes it subjective and that means that how you feel about it what you want it to be and so on you can actually um, actually alter it to suit yourself so um, I think it's very real very accurate uh, to suggest that uh, reality depends on who is seeing it, who is perceiving it, who is giving it validity. Yeah. Okay. Now, Sister Denise, um, we are all coming from a personal space as far as um, uh, seeing and observing and thinking and believing is concerned. Um, how? must I change my way of being uh, to ensure that um, my perception is not warped, it's not counterproductive, it's not harming another person or myself. What you just shared falls into the category of we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> so you need to um, remind the self of that. And it's a very rare person that uh, sees something or apprehends something without filters. There are filters of projection, filters of prejudice, filters of assumption, presumption, all of these things actually distort our perception. And uh, I think what one needs to do is really take a good solid look and, um, and just see uh, where my prejudices lie because prejudice is a big factor that distorts perception. Is anything real then? If uh, there are seven, bil seven and a half billion of us on the planet, we're all seeing things from our own uh, glasses, through our own glasses, um, is what's real? Well, that's a, that's a big question. You know, um, there you are in the middle of your reality. And the angle from which you see the scene that we are in now is very different from the angle that I'm seeing. And we are here with cameras. And each camera is seeing something very different from the other camera. And so we switch from angle to angle. This is very normal in videotaping. But um, very few people realize that you know, every person is a soul with a sphere around them of reality and that they perceive only from that angle. Uh, it is a very good practice, actually, in, um, in spiritual practice to, you know, pull yourself out of your body and sort of position yourself uh, near to where you are or quite far from where you are and try and look at yourself then you get an angle on yourself which is a different angle. Uh, sometimes even people will actually get themselves filmed so that they can see how they come across to another person because how I see myself from in here is going to be very different from how you see me from over there and your perception of me is going to be influenced by um, how you feel about me, what you think about me, what you've heard about me, etc. So to have a completely um, neutral, impartial view of a situation means you need to be very clear about anywhere that there may be some distortions. And you can tell, but a lot of people just don't. Mm -hmm. So um, objective reality, I don't know how easy it is to, to uh, have that. I think what we have more is an agreement among people that such and such is reality. But you know, when you start going from culture to culture, you find that there is um, an angle that a whole culture will use to agree on what's real, what's important, etc. And then when you go to a different culture, that other culture sees the same thing as you're seeing, but so differently has such a different response to it that you could never even have imagined. And I think that intercultural um, interaction is very useful so that you can get a feel for someone else's view of the same thing that you think is real, and you realize it's real for you, it's real for people like you, but uh, for somebody in a very different culture, uh, they see it so differently that you really lose the uh, conviction that what you're seeing is objective reality. So, Sister Denise, we all have a history uh, that contains, for most people on the planet, um, a measure of pain, a measure of trauma, a measure of um, neglect, feelings of abandonment, feelings of rejection. The list is endless. Uh, that's also 
uh, forms part of the filters that you were referring to, isn't that so? Definitely. Mm. Okay. So, um, is it incumbent upon a spiritually aware individual to go through each and every one of those filters and clean up a house? It's like being a uh, owner of a um, of an eighty-four room mansion. I'm using the number eighty-four, just um, just like that. Um, and do you go to into room by room and clean out so that um, you're not held back by that experience? Is is that the duty upon somebody who's spiritually aware? I think it's an extremely valuable thing to do um, because what you want to do uh, in your spiritual practice is to, to detect where your filters are. And I find that actually uh, one of the most useful things is not so much to look at stuff that's happened to you per se, which is very personal, uh, but also to see um, or to live with people of different cultures. Because I think it's really the cultural thing that um, makes a huge difference. Um, people uh, operate to a very large extent by association. And so within a particular culture, there's a whole bunch of associations that are common for other people of that culture. And that can even include how you handle abandonment, uh, rejection, etc. Because, you know, all the people of your culture will have some measure of that. And there's even a cultural, uh, culturally specific way of dealing with it or way of reacting to it, which people are not realizing until you start to move out of your particular culture. You know, in, in your culture, it is normal to deal with the feeling of abandonment in a certain way. Go to another culture, um, people who experienced abandonment um, will experience it differently because their culture thinks about ab abandonment differently. So we are not um, quite as individual as we, we believe very often. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, looking at it individually, we, we need to really look at what causes what inside me, what um, are the triggers that make me think and feel in particular ways, you know, because I think t the more you strive to be objective and uh, free from all of these things, I don't think you can be totally but you can uh, clean it up to quite a big extent. And mm. the cleaner you are, the more um, unbiased your, your perception of reality is. So, Sir Denise, uh, say for example, a, a five-year-old child was uh, savagely bitten by a dog. And uh, it was a particular breed of dog. So for the rest of her life, um, she's not scared of animals because her family has pets, but she's wary of them. Um, if you let go of your experiences, um, you, it's as if you haven't learned anything. How can one um, extract a lesson from an experience but not be traumatized by it because it makes sense as an adult that before you step into someone's house or yard to ask uh, hello do you have any dogs and please make sure that they you know tied up so that um, you know don't get attacked again that would be wise um, because I think to a large extent uh, the reason we have these filters is for our own self-protection well, it's part of it. Of course, it depends very much. I'm thinking as you gave that example, I have a cousin who was savagely attacked by a dog and bitten in the face. So there's a huge scar. But um, this young boy always um, felt rather proud of that scar. Oh, okay. And um, 
really doesn't have a really worked through the the um, experience in a very healthy way and um, turned it to his advantage so you can do that also mm. okay okay now sister Denise um, God uh, what is God's reality um, you used the term to describe him in a previous episode as being the truth what does the truth see how does he see how does he think does God think does God feel uh, and wha what does he see that's going on here on earth that well we don't well you know God doesn't perceive things chronologically God knows all things um, all at once knows hmm. is different it's not a human being oh okay so when God um, if God is watching this uh, this episode right now he's not watching us speak it's as if he already watched the entire episode so he's aware of the contents of the full episode something like that um, I or, d I or did he watch the whole series <laughs> You know, um, my understanding is that God sees the whole thing as a, as a totality, the whole way the world works from the beginning through the middle to the end. And so there is that global picture and then God can kind of zoom in to particular present moments and uh, know what brought it to that moment and where it's going. So doesn't see things um, just the way we do. You know, we see a little bit of background, we anticipate a little bit of future, and here we are. That's a human um, perception. God's perception, he knows who you are, who you were, who you're going to be, what are all the changes that you take place. Uh, he knows you, uh, the way that you can never know you. So it's very different. But uh, the thing about God is God is so subtle. Different people have different uh, mystical experiences of God and will perceive God through that experience. God will present himself to humanity and say, well, this is me, this is how I am. And each one will interpret it in their own way. Then there are other people who uh, make assumptions about God uh, that they think, oh, well, you know, God would get angry by such and such a thing. And so we're going to make sure that um, he's pleased with us by sorting out that person who would have offended God. But there you, you get into a lot of trouble because of the assumptions and presumptions about God that uh, uh, you know, it's so out of the range of proving that it becomes um, like a fanatical belief system. And you get a lot of that in the world today. So in, in some uh, environments, you, you cannot touch the subject because anything you do is inflammatory. Mm. And so that makes it very difficult to sit and talk about God. So it's a limitation that we just have to come to terms with, but uh, when you are in an environment where you're free to to talk, to share your experience, your understanding, and uh, everybody has a right to their own interpretation and so on, that uh, that is a lot easier, mm -hmm. you know. But um, the reality of God, because it's so subtle and because each one perceives God and experiences God um, from their own angle, um, it becomes a little difficult to make categorical statements like that. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, now Sister Denise, um, from what you said about reality, it makes uh, sense that uh, we uh, take a good look inside and look at um, our belief system, our prejudices, and all of the things that we essentially thought, this is who I am. Okay, now um, I would like you to take us through one aspect. 
um, feelings. Okay. Uh, yes, I understand what you said uh, on a previous episode that thoughts comes before feelings, but many experience life through their feelings. They they hold more power, mm -hmm. actually, over an individual than thoughts mm -hmm. because it's your feelings. We all uh, own our feelings. How does one uh, learn to see the wood from the trees as far as your feelings are concerned? Because even our negative feelings, especially our negative feelings, are my feelings. Don't you dare come between me <laughs> and my feelings. So well, of course. Yes. How do, we, how do we heal from that? Well, you know, you um, perceive an event and you feel something through that perception and you will say that was a bad occurrence or that was a beautiful occurrence. It's very subjective and you may um, reassess your evaluation that was a bad situation and then later on you'll say oh that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it was a wake-up call. Uh, so um, so when you realize, oh, that was a wake-up call, then your experience of it, with hindsight, will actually change. At that time, you experienced it as a really bad thing, but then you realize it's a wake-up call, so you kind of go back and re-feel it from a different angle and feel it differently mm. in terms of what you hold in your memory about your feelings. Because when you are feeling something, you're feeling it at that moment and then it, you, it goes into your memory so that you can remember what you felt. Mm. And depending on how you feel about what you felt, you can actually change <laughs> what you felt and you won't even realize that you altered it. So, so something may be very extreme and you minimize it. Something may be really small and you make a mountain out of it and you get yourself into a big tears over a small thing uh, because you had actually um, intensified your feelings about that thing by how you thought about it you see so you can actually um, alter what you felt retrospectively retroactively so it's a bit difficult to deal with because it's a a feeling, mm. very ephemeral. Okay. Okay, so Sister Denise, um, a healthy person, a spiritually healthy person, what is their reality? How, how do they be? How do you be in a way that's um, um, balanced, stable, um, clean inside, where you see life as it is instead of through your filters? Well, I think that um, you say whatever it is, whatever it was, uh, what am I, how am I interpreting it? Am I interpreting it to my advantage? Am I learning lessons from it? What am I doing for myself with that experience? Um, and so I think I prefer to actually use what we call the power of transformation to take benefit from something that you may have had very strong feelings about but just to have strong feelings about it doesn't make it so um, useful for you in a way. I think it's how you interpret it, how you make use of or turn to your advantage a memory. So, so then your feelings about it change. And I think also, you know, it is said that time is a healer. So something that may be very intense at a certain moment, uh, later on you kind of don't mind about it and uh, it kind of fades and it's all right, you let it go. Sister Denise, a person who engages with God on a frequent basis, um, what is their reality like? And how is it different from somebody who doesn't? When you engage continuously with God, you're also aware of God's 
description of God's perspective on reality. You see, and uh, what we learn in Raj Yoga, in Brahma Kumaris, is that God looks at it all as a big game or a play. And um, there are times when God says, you know, why don't you just look at your situation as sort of a Tom and Jerry cartoon? Um, because then it makes it a whole lot lighter. And you can see the funny side of it and not take it so heavy. Then sometimes God will say, well, you know, it's a drama and you're an actor, so here's a situation. Now, how are you going to act in this situation? And then um, you, you don't get kind of overwhelmed by your feelings, but as an actor, okay, here's a very difficult situation. Now, how are you going to deal with it as an actor? And I think God likes it when we take it lightly. Sister Denise, thank you so much. It is a very um, a curiously interesting topic and something that's worth pondering over. So thank you. Okay. So there you have it. Reality is in the eye of the beholder. So I do wish that you take this message to heart and I also wish you everything of the best in your own spiritual quest. Thank you so much for joining us and I do hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.